All right. Okay. Court. I'll edit that part out. Make people don't want to see up my nostrils. Amen. <laughs> uh, so um, I mentioned uh, in prayer time that uh, this week has been just interesting. I've gotten a, a renewal of sorts in my spirit. I've gotten an extra amount of energy that I was not expecting. It was just a nice, pleasant surprise that it just really kicked out of nowhere. Um, and it really just led me into wonderful places in Scripture. And what I want to talk to you all about, what I would like to minister on this morning, is being haunted by the spirit of guilt. I feel like since we're close enough to Halloween, if we want to talk about hauntings, let's talk about some hauntings. Because it is, what, what does the word haunted mean? It means when something will not leave you alone. It sticks to you. Something un Desirable sticks to you and it haunts you. And nothing sticks to a person like the spirit of guilt. We've all felt it. At one time or another, you have been guilty for something in your life. If you're like me, then you were guilty for a lot of things in your youth. Amen. And if you ever want to message my mom on Facebook, she's got stories. I tell you. I'm not going to share them, though, so you all just keep on looking elsewhere. <laughs> but to have guilt is to acknowledge sin. And I think that if you look around the world today, we have done a very good job trying to rename sin. We use words like, well, that's not sin, that's just my weakness. It's just a weakness I have. Or that's not sin, that's just a mistake that I made when I was young. That's not really sin. But ladies and gentlemen, the Bible does not play semantics with us. Sin is sin. When we screw up, yes, it was a mistake, but that mistake is sin. Amen? Amen. And we feel guilty when we're not walking in the will of God. We feel guilty when we have taken ourselves and we say, I'm more comfy over here. When God says you should be over there. And there's a couple of passages of scripture I'd like to share with you this morning. The first one, our main scripture, is going to be in the book of Zechariah, the prophets. We're going to the prophets this morning. So go to the prophet Zechariah, Old Testament. Go, go past Jeremiah. Go past Daniel. You'll find them in the back of the Old Testament. If you want to start with uh, Micah, right before the Old Testament, right before the New Testament. Go backwards a little bit. You'll get there quicker. Go right. Go past Micah. Start at the Gospel of Matthew. Go backwards. Micah. Then you'll get to Zechariah. And then I want you to go to Zechariah chapter 3. And what we're going to see here is we're going to see a vision. Again, Zechariah was a prophet. So he got these visions that he shared with the host of Israel. And we're going to read this. And it includes a high priest. It includes a priest. That stands before God, an angel of the Lord, and Satan. But I'll have the Bible speak for me. I don't want to overstep. I'll let the Word of God really say it and lay it out for you. So in chapter 3, verse 1, that's where we'll begin. Of Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1, it says, And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? So a few things we see here. Again, we have God. Again, we have an angel of the Lord. And we have Satan. Satan's there with one intention. To resist the will of God. We need to understand his purpose in your life. Satan's purpose in this world is to resist the will of God. I don't think anyone in here will argue with me on that. That's just his primary purpose. He is not an enemy because he does not have any power. He is not the opposite of God. That's not who Satan is. He is not the opposite of God. He is not the anti-God. He doesn't have any power that God will not allow him to have. Matter of fact, I would like to just tell you, Satan is afraid of you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing Satan is more afraid of than somebody who is on fire for Jesus Christ, who is on fire and willing to be effective in the name of the Lord. And we know this because in James chapter 4, James chapter 4, James chapter 1, and James chapter 3, we see that if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. All throughout the book of James, we see one strong theme. If you follow the will of God, Satan will flee from you. And he, then he goes on and tells you how a Christian is supposed to act. There is one thing Satan's afraid of, and he is afraid of you who are going to be effective in the name of God. But anyway, in this vision of Zechariah, we have Satan standing before uh, Joshua and standing before the angel of God and standing before the Lord himself to resist the will of God. And then in verse 2, the Lord says unto Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Satan, even the Lord, even the Lord of Jerusalem, even the host of Jerusalem rebuke you. He's talking about his people. He's saying, not only do I rebuke you and cast you out, not only do I dismiss you, not only do I have power over you, but my children who call after me, my children who look to me and call after me, even they will rebuke you. My children rebuke you. That is our goal. When Satan is in our life, when we have sin, when we have guilt, and he starts to make us feel bad, we are to resist him because he is resisting the Lord. And who do you think is going to win? Let me tell you, God already won on the cross. So if we resist him, he will flee from you. And if we follow after the will of God, he will have absolutely no power over you. can't even touch you. So what we have here is then we get into this aspect of chapter, of, uh, at the end of chapter, uh, verse 2. It says, is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? He's talking about Joshua, the high priest. Now, the high priest was that person that stood before the people. This was that person that was supposed to be high up on that spiritual totem pole of society in that day. And he was standing before it says, is this not a brand plucked from the fire? He's talking about the humanity of Joshua. Joshua represents mankind. All of us. We put ourselves in Joshua's place. We are a brand plucked from the fire because of God's salvation, Christ's salvation on the cross. We have been plucked from eternal damnation. Amen? Amen. We are a brand plucked from the fire. <coughs> and he says, is this not a brand plucked from the fire? And in verse 3, it says, now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. If you plan to stand before God, would you choose clean garments or would you choose uh, filthy garments? Well, sometimes it, it's, hard to teach, it's hard to think of what, what kind of outfit I would pick. The way if you see me dress throughout the week, sometimes I'm wearing a Hawaiian shirt when I'm mowing the yard. All right? But I hope that we all desire to wear clean garments. We, that's what we, how we come to church, isn't it? Sunday best. You put on your Sunday best when you go into the God's house. Why do you put on your Sunday best? Because no one wants to be dirty before the Lord. Cleanliness is close to godliness. I think we forget about John the Baptist and what he wore when we say things like that. But all right, all right. But the thing is, he goes before God. Joshua's standing before God and built the garments. This is representing shame. This is representing guilt. This is representing, you guessed it, sin. He is standing filthy because he is drenched in his sin. That is the filthy garments. And he stands before God. He stands before the angel. He stands before Satan. And this is a court case. I want us all to understand this. This is a court case. Satan is condemning Joshua because he's condemning mankind. Well, they sinned. They, he has gone far from you. He is dirty. You don't deal with dirtiness. And Satan has a good case. Let me tell you, you he has a good case. He, we have been severed from the will of God because of sin. That's why we feel guilty. 
If you read the book of Genesis, if you read Genesis chapter 3, after the fall of mankind, Adam and Eve did notice that they are shamefully unclothed and they hide before the, the eyes of the Lord. They try to hide themselves. And God has to call out and say, where are you? I, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat of the fruit? Did you do what I explicitly told you not to? And we've all been there. We know the Word of God says, do not do these things, and we've done those things. No one is excused from this. No one is uh, completely upright. There is no one who is good according to Romans chapter 3. Verse 9, no, not one, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. But, here's our deal. What we do is we stand before the Lord, like in verse 3. We stand as Joshua in verse 3. And here's what happens in verse 4. He answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. This is God talking to Joshua. He answered and spake, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I clothe thee with a change of raiment. So what's going on here? We have God who says to Joshua, who is being accused by the adversary Satan. Satan is laughing and being snide. He's saying, He is unclean. You cannot have him. He is not yours. He is he is gone against your will. And God looks at Joshua and says, let's remove the garments off of him. Take it. Take off the gross stuff you're wearing. Take off the sin, in other words. Let's pull that sin off. Let's pull that shame off. Let's pull that guilt off and give him a nice change of fresh clothes. This is a representation of salvation and what it does for us. Many of us in the church, we walk around as if we're still in our dirty garments. We carry baggage. And let me tell you something, you can do a real good job making dirty baggage look good in front of people. You can fake it with the church. You can fake it with your next door neighbor. You can fake it with your boss at work. You can fake it with your grandkids. You can fake it with your children. But you can't fake it with God. Amen? Amen. He sees the baggage that you're carrying that you should have dropped the moment you accepted His salvation and called Him Lord. When He says, Come on to me, you who are heavy laden, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. We should have left it there at the cross when we came to Him and heard His call. But some of us were in the business of carrying our guilt and shame because we think, well, I've done it wrong. I've done something wrong. Yes, you've done something wrong, but quit beating yourself up about it. You have been forgiven. And you've got no business growing with the Lord and trying to hold on to old baggage. He took that off of you. You have had those dirty garments removed. You are spotless. You are white. You are not perfect, but you are blameless. The difference between perfect and blameless, perfect means you'll never do anything rotten again. Blameless means you know how to be forgiven, reclaimed, and even though you still will fall into sin here and there, you will not practice it. Amen. You strive to follow the will of God. You may make a mistake or two, but we have built-in safety procedures for that. Thank God. You are not wearing dirty, filthy garments. You are wearing a change of new ramet clothing. So take the new clothing. You are spotless. You are beautiful for him. And then in verse 4 it says, And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, talking about God. He takes away the filthy garment. I have caused your iniquity uh, to pass from you. And then in verse 5 he says, And I said, this is Zechariah, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. This is talking about the turban that he wore. The high priestly turban. Because now Joshua is fully clean. He now is able to execute himself in a way of blamelessness. Not perfection. Blamelessness. 
to be able to be an example of those who have fallen away from the Lord. He now can be an example because the Lord has forgiven him and pulled off his shame and his own guilt and has reclaimed him and put him in his proper position to stand before the people and say, the Lord is forgiving and loving. Amen? Amen. So as we continue off from there, here's what we have to say. We see in verse 5, he continues to take that turban, put it on his head, and so they set it upon his head and clothed him with garments, good, healthy garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by, and the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, if you will keep my charge, and you shall also judge my house, and shall keep my courts, I will give you places to walk among these that stand by. So what does that mean? That simply means because Joshua has been <coughs> reclaimed, because Joshua has stood before the presence of God and he has accepted that forgiveness and he has put aside his guilt, he's put aside his shame, he's put aside all of these dangerous stepping stones. He is now, if he walks in the way of the Lord, he has the ability to help others and to lead others to be accountable unto the Lord. Amen? This is the same for you and me. Whenever we go to be before the Lord, if we want to be effective, if we want to be able to resist Satan, who has no ability to resist the Lord, who has no ability to stand on his own two feet, if we want that ability, we have to walk in his ways. Amen. We have to walk in his charge. We have to walk where he has asked us to walk. And because we will listen to him, he will put us where we need to be when we need to be there. You don't plan the party, you just are along for the ride. Amen? But here's what we do there. We have to understand first, we have to let go of the filthy clothing. You can't claim to be clean if you're filthy. Who remembers the Peanuts? Anybody remember the Peanuts characters? You're all fibbing. You all read the Sunday paper once or twice. You all seen Thanksgiving episodes. Okay? Who y'all remember that character Pigpen? He was one of those kids. He was always filthy, always those stink lines off of you. Well, I, I don't know if, if uh, y'all paid attention to those episodes, but he always told people he was clean. I, I wonder if he knew why they called him Pigpen. He had all those stink lines. He had all that dirt coming off of him. And then finally, in the new movie that came out in uh, 2017, there was this uh, part where they actually dump a bucket of water over Pigpen, and he, he's unrecognizable because he's clean. Doesn't have all the dirt spots. Ladies and gentlemen, we spend too much time walking around in our own filth thinking that we're clean. But when we do get clean, we become unrecognizable. Amen? If we are clean, we are to be a different person. We are to look differently, act differently, associate with people differently. Because the dirty garments have been removed. I was listening to John Maxwell just yesterday. Uh, it was raining. There was really nothing else to do. I was listening to a good audio book. And it was called The Three Things, The Three uh, Ways Successful People Think by John Maxwell. And he specified something very important. It was, in fact, it's a fact that how you think, positive or negative, will determine how successful in life you'll be. We're not talking finances. We're not talking about material status. We're talking about purpose. If you want to be successful in identifying your purpose, you have to have a positive attitude because there has never been a successful negative person. Nobody gets to be successful because they've spent a lifetime being negative or cynical. And the proof of this is, well, back uh, when they were building the Trump Tower, do you, all, do you all know where that is? It's in New York City, Trump Tower. When they were building this magnificent building, many people, when they were laying, the construction workers were laying the concrete, they went and casted a survey. They casted a survey. They asked three individuals. The first individual, they walked up with a camera and said, what are you doing? And he says, trying to earn a living. Then he rushes off and does his job, and they go to a second guy. What are you doing? And he looks at them with a snide facial expression. What does it look like I'm doing? I'm laying concrete here. You know New Yorkers. They have a way with people, don't they? But then they go up to this third person who's whistling. 
He's just carrying on in the heat of the day, wiping off sweat, spreading the concrete. And they say, what are you doing? And he says, I'm building the most beautiful building ever in New York. And he, said, and he points over to the other slab of concrete the other guys are laying. That's where the lobby will be. That over there is where the desk will be. And over an hour had passed before they had to cut off that interview with this guy. And they noticed the difference here in their success patterns. Those two other individuals, they had no vision. They had no positivity in what they were doing. They let negativity bring them down. But the man that they were talking to, the man that they were discussing this with, he had a vision, he had passion, he had positivity, and he was achieving success by spreading concrete, not because he loved to spread concrete, but because he had a positivity of how it was going to affect the rest. He was part of something bigger. Ladies and gentlemen, we can argue in the church about what the name on the side of the building is. We can argue about what color carpet we want. We can argue what kind of pew we want or whether we want more comfy chairs. I mean, it doesn't matter. But the point is, are we part of the vision of reaching hearts to be on fire for Christ? Are we excited? Are we passionate? Are we just here? I don't want people who are just here. I want people who are here excited to reach others for the will of God. We, we have a need to get out of spiritual infancy. We come to Christ. We get saved. We're going to heaven. Woo-hoo! What's next? Oh, man. I guess that's it. I, I, I'm, I, I'm here. No. We are called to come out of that spiritual infancy and say, what is next? I receive spiritual giftings. What am I supposed to do with that? I am supposed to reach others. I'm supposed to, A, fight off the attacks of Satan. And let me tell you, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be attacked by Satan in your life. Do not fool yourself into thinking it's just going to be a rose walk, a cake walk, even though that sounds delicious. It's not going to be one of those things. It's going to be hard. It's going to be dutiful. And when you are there, you are in adolescence. When you fight against Satan, you are in spiritual adolescence. And then what comes off of that adolescence? You go into spiritual man and womanhood, which is where you become a spiritual parent as the Apostle Paul was a spiritual father onto Timothy and to Silas. We are called to be spiritual parents onto spiritual infants. We are to take people who are new in their spiritual walk, take them under our wing and set an example before them because we have been walking with the Lord for some time. And it's time to rub off what we've learned in our walk with Him. There's one other piece of scripture I would like to read with you before our time here is done. If you guys could turn back into the Old Testament, I'd like to go to Psalm chapter 32. Psalm 32. And what we need to emphasize here is that we get to this point by A, removing our dirty garments. We allow the Lord to remove these filthy garments from us. We remove our shame, remove our guilt. But we also need to understand that the big, the big win is being forgiven of our transgressions. You are forgiven. You are renewed. And if you don't believe me, this is a truth that is old as time itself. Even the, even the servant David, King David, had to make an announcement onto salvation. So let's talk about here real quick. In verse 1 of chapter 32, of Psalm chapter 32, it says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord inputteth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bone waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For all day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid, I said. I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. 
I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be you not as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and brittle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy that ye are upright in heart. Amen. What we have built in here is that you are forgiven when you call upon the name of the Lord. How do we become forgiven? We open our mouth and we confess before His presence our transgressions. There is no way to be forgiven of God without confessing to Him what you have done from your mouth. This is all over the New Testament, all over Scripture. You must confess to God. It's between you and God, and if it affects the church, if it hurts the church, if it damages the church, it must be a part of the church. You cannot be a part of the church if you do not go before God and confess your sins. Amen? There is no way to do it. Well, He already forgave the whole world. This is a dangerous teaching, by the way. This is not something I believe. This is something I want everyone to be aware of. I, was, I heard it from the time I was, a young, uh, I was a young man, that when Jesus died on that cross, He forgave the whole wide world. And that you just need to accept that and that you're good to go and you've been forgiven for everything. No! No! Let's slow down this roll. He died on the cross so we could have a high priest to confess our sins onto. Amen? You, just because He died on that cross, does not make you automatically forgiven. He died so we could be forgiven. But we cannot forget the step of, of confessing our sins unto Him. There is no side road. Well, it makes me feel bad when I confess it. Let me tell you, the moment you confess it into the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord will forgive you instantly. You have no reason to fear that He will not forgive you. He will forgive anyone, anything with the sincerity of your heart confessing your sin to Him. You do not have to worry about Him saying, no thanks. That's just not part of the deal. You confess your sin, He forgives, and you will feel better. Because what you're feeling is the spirit of guilt. And we've already discussed back in Zechariah. You have to give up those garments, those filthy garments. You have to give up those baggage of shame and guilt. Lay it at the feet of Christ. You have been redeemed. And if you don't believe me, take a look here at the end of verse 24 of 30, or verse 11, sorry, of 32. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous. Talking about people who have confessed their name unto the Lord, confessed their sin unto the Lord, and have received His forgiveness. You are called righteous when you come to Him. Not because you are righteous, but because He has made you righteous. His Spirit through you has brought righteousness. So when you have received His forgiveness, He labels you righteous and shout for joy that you are upright in heart because your heart desires to do what is upright. Amen. The will of God is that we take off these garments of filth we stop lugging them around it it's hard but thank god for spiritual scissors he will cut that filth off of you if you verbally vocalize it by name with him don't be afraid to confess your sin by name if we don't confess it we rob ourselves of that blessing of that spiritual renewal. And it, what it does is it strongly amplifies the spirit of the Lord within you to say, I will keep you from doing this again. And that's a beautiful thing I think we all want. If we make a mistake, I doubt any of us want to make it again. Amen? Amen. We want to stay afar from that stuff. I don't, who, who likes to feel like they're in the wrong? Nobody. Because that spirit of guilt haunts you. 
How do we get rid of it? We get rid of it by having it removed, by coming into the presence of God and having it cut off. So quit carrying your garments of filth and receive the forgiveness of Christ Amen. as we confess our sins onto Him and Him alone. Amen. I'm glad that we have all been here today and I'm glad that you guys allowed me to share that with you this morning. I believe the Lord has blessed me greatly. I hope that I'm not alone in that. But uh, let's go to him this morning. I'd like to call Sister Peggy up here. We'll go into our invitational time. And let's just talk to him. Let's not just sit around and let's not just keep our eyes closed and wondering what I, when I can go to lunch. Let's really talk to him. Some of us are just tired of carrying around our filthy garments. It causes a stench wherever we go. We want to be clean. We want to be renewed. We want that newness of energy uplifted. We want it now. We want it now because He offers it now. I want to know when we're on fire. I want to know when I can bring people under my wing. I want to know when I am going to be able to have Satan afraid of me because of my effectiveness in Him. So let's go to Him this morning. here today just of protection and good goodwill onto you that the Lord continues to follow your families and to you personally that we can continue to strive to be our very very best and have him lead us to where others can be affected in the positive sensation of Christ's love so let's pray Heavenly Father we thank you for your word here today we thank you for the people that have shown up to hear from you and Father, we pray that as we continue to leave this building, that you do not stop the worship, that you amplify it seven times over, that when we leave this building, it is just a continuation of today's service in our hearts, that we can reach other people and be effective for you onto them, to lead them in a place where they need to come to realize that you are God of the universe and that, that only through you can they receive the peace that they long for. Father, I pray that you just continue to be with our church and you use this ministry to move in a mighty way that others will come to be saved under your good grace and that we continue to mature in the way that we need to be to long after you. Not that we search after just getting to heaven, but Lord, that we strive to bring others with us along the way and that we continue to ask your blessings of protection for us as we enjoy our time and fellowship with one another and with our families but that you keep everyone in good health, Father, so that we can continue to look to you in all things and build upon our trust in your holy name. It's in Jesus' name we end and pray. Amen. Thank you all so much, and I'm really glad that we got to spend this time together. Hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday. And remember uh, the...
a trunk or treat for the Francisco Fellowship Church from 5 o'clock to 7 this Tuesday, the 31st. Thank you so much. God bless.